Welcome to New Thinking for a New World, a Tilburg Foundation podcast. I am Alan Stoga, your host. Each week, I bring you conversations with people who think differently about the great issues that are shaping our world. Geopolitics, disruptive tech, mass migration, the changing climate, culture wars, all of it is grist for our mill. I hope you enjoy listening. I also hope you will let me know what you think and that you join the conversation at telbergfoundation.org. And now for today's episode of New Thinking for a New World. The summer of 2023 might be remembered as the year that people almost everywhere finally began to understand what global warming means in fact, not in theory. Unrelenting record heat, widespread drought, massive wildfires, water shortages, matched by excessive rains elsewhere, followed by destructive 100-year floods, these have become the new normal. Anyone who is surprised simply hasn't been paying attention. The science and the modeling have been clear and pretty accurate, at least since the 70s. But like the proverbial frogs in the slowly heating water, we've been content to ignore the evidence. The obvious question is whether it's now too late to reverse all this, at least within the kind of timescale that matters to people alive today. That question is usually answered by dreamy scientists who are working on their version of the Big Bang. We're going to try something different today by asking it of Paula DiPerna, a policy expert and author who has spent decades thinking about how to solve the climate crisis. Paula has just published a book, Pricing the Priceless that essentially argues the answer is, well, obvious. Paula, welcome to New Thinking for a New World. Thank you, Alan. A pleasure to be here. I want to start with a question that you ask in your book, and I quote, why do our capital markets value companies like Uber, which offer services we can live without at billions of dollars, but our atmosphere on which all life depends at zero? And isn't that the core of the problem? To me, it's the core of the problem. And uh, the answer is the core of the solution, because, you know, I think we've we've seen that, um, you know, raw material, of course, is an input. But if you go beyond what you need for input um, at no price or low price, you're going to get what we have, which is, <clears throat> you know, an undervaluation and something like Uber, not to pick on them, but what what came to me is one day when I when Uber was brand new and and people were excited they had booked me an Uber and um, did I want to watch the car on their phone uh, getting closer and closer and I thought hmm I don't know why that's so exciting it's just a taxi service with a different name you know and I just looked up the the market cap uh, of Uber and real and found out it was higher that day than General Motors so Uber drives cars. General Motors makes them, but Uber's market cap was was higher. And so that kind of triggered the thinking of, well, how does that happen? And of course, I know capital valuation is somewhat in the eye of the beholder and the investor. But until we switch this and start looking at that very remote and very uh, uh, limited atmospheric space, which is 60 miles of supply of space that's all very much crowded, valuing it at practically at zero until we flip this idea and figure out how to put market cap, so to speak, into the atmosphere so that we respect its value. Um, we're going to have, we're going to be behind the eight ball in, in addressing climate change, because as you pointed out, the, the impacts of these extremes uh, are very costly and we don't seem to have the cash up front to really get at it. But that begs the question whether in fact, it's possible to get at it first. Second, whether it can be done in the ways that we clearly are failing. We're trying lots of things, but they're all failing, at least as measured by what you and I see as we look out our windows. Uh, clearly, the climate in the summer of 2023 isn't particularly pleasant in most places of the world. So you are certainly right that and I was trained as an economist, if it's free, you abuse it. That's almost a basic principle of economics. Uh, yet we continue to abuse it. It, our planet. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, as you know, 
that's going to continue. I mean, you mentioned the wildfires. So, you know, what, what turned me on about writing this book, apart from the, it was truly a personal exploration because I was not trained as an economist and um, not trained in finance. And so I really, it was an exploration and a kind of a feeling of the onion for me. Uh, and I went around the world looking for examples of to bear out my my thesis that if we shifted and it wasn't it isn't just my thesis my job was to synthesize thinking that has been going on and what you could call ecosystem services and bringing the externalities that have been outside of the bookkeeping system namely environmental services into accounting and how to do that and as you know economists have been squabbling and reckoning with that for decades but. So I came upon, for example, this forest resilience bond, which is something we can do in our lifetime and is proving itself to be quite successful. And and what does that do? That was the brainchild of four very young uh, Haas uh, business school students out in Berkeley. And their insight was that a, a resilient forest, by which I mean a forest that's healthy, that has um, resistance to wildfire that that is that is uh, not diseased that is not crowded that is relatively moist um, that there are beneficiaries to that forest that and you could tote up and you can count up the value of those benefits across the very disparate set of beneficiaries and the the the, the set of beneficiaries of a resilient forest are kind of disparate and interesting so you, obviously you think of uh, you know, the rest of us who like the idea of forests. But what about the hydropower company that is trying to keep water literally going over its dam and feeder streams and feeder rivers to those reservoirs draw from the water table? And water table, if it's too dry, less water, less water over the dam, the hydropower has to buy power from another source. So that's a cost that you can figure out. Then you have um, the tourism operators who benefit from the forest being resilient by being able to promote tourism products that take people into the forest. And you don't want to promote a product that into a forest that could, you know, sort of catch fire at any moment. Then you have the public service budgets that are stretched because they're they're budgets to. uh, uh, prevent forest fires and, and maintain the forest for resiliency uh, are stretched because that money is going to put out fires because there's such an increase in wildfire, California being the poster example of that. So the, the, the resilience bond takes all those beneficiaries, puts them in a room, totes up the benefits, and then goes to the private market and says, do you want to invest in these benefits? If you do, you'll get a premium from these beneficiaries who will pay you back over time. And so the, the money comes in from capital markets, and in that case, also foundations at the pilot stage, to, and the money goes right into forest maintenance, as opposed to um, being uh, the, the money not being there for forest maintenance. So money in upfront, risk borne by the investors, forest made more resilient benefits later. And you can actually put a value on that via the benefits, and it transfers into a financial instrument. And the, and the people who set that up was the first one was a $4 million bond, and now they have two $25 million offerings and a potential infrastructure portfolio that's set up just the way you fund infrastructure. It's the same investment idea. It's a wonderful example. It's all important, but with all due respect, it's tiny almost trivial compared to the magnitude of the problem and the time scale of the problem. And, and that's really the point. I was reading a JP Morgan report this morning about the next, their effort to look at the next 20 years or so. And they made the obvious point, but it's, it's what you've been saying, that the only way to convince the world to dramatically cut carbon emissions is to put a seriously high price on carbon. Uh, the little problem with that is that it's not new news. And various countries have been thinking about it, some of them even doing it. Today, something like 20% or so of green, global, global greenhouse gas emissions are covered by government efforts to try to price carbon. But that's only 20%. 
at, at a world where we are at, I repeat, 420 ppm, where we are clearly about to blow through one and a half degrees uh, warming, et cetera. So we have, as you've just outlined with the, the forest restoration bond, and, and there are other examples, and you cite them in the book, the terrific example is a very innovative work being done that is important work. But is it, does it match the scale and the urgency of the problem uh, yeah, yeah. Well, no, that's the issue. And I mean, I guess what I'd say is it's trivial now, but you could, what would prevent the pr prime minister of Canada from going to the financial markets based on the proven example of the California experiment and say, I want to, I want to issue a bond or bonds that covers the whole forest uh, structure, uh, the whole forest covering that covers Canada. Why it's a rhetorical question, but it's an important one because he hasn't done so. And well, he's an environmentalist. Okay, but one, I, I'd love to get a, a meeting with him and, and, and put the question there. But also, to your point, and you've always talked about this, Alan, is you know the distinction between big ideas and executing big ideas. I feel just as, as a practical matter, we've almost got no appetite left for big ideas. Big ideas are, you know, uh, AI. You know, big ideas are not um, – the big idea would be to do a forest bond for the whole entire country of Canada or the entire state of California. There's no nothing preventing that except doing it. That, that, that's exactly my question. Something is preventing these things from happening because they're not happening. There's a wonderful quote in your book from Charles Keeling, uh, who did amazing chemistry work back in the 50s, uh, as you know, because you write about it. Um, and and – did the first estimates of the concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. And, and the quote is this, if the human race survives into the 21st century, the people living then, us, us today now, may face the threat of climate change brought about by uncontrolled increase of atmospheric CO2 from fossil fuels. This, this is a man writing in the 50s. But he was optimistic that his students in the 50s would be the first generation and, and this, and you quote this, it's fascinating, to feel such strong concern for man's future that they will discover means of effective action. That is 75 years ago. Um, why didn't they? Well, I mean, a simple one thing is you kick the can. But, and I'd love your views on this. So I don't know if you play uh, slot machines, but as you know, when, you know, the jackpot is... <clears throat> cherries all across or bananas all across. Now, I don't play them either, but I know that much. And so if you think about three wheels, I think one of the reasons we haven't done much or done enough quickly enough is because of the proverbial siloization, but not everything, just three things, science, policy, and capital. So science has run Keeling's, you know, Keeling curve ran on a scientific timeline that was very much the scientific method. Research comes in, it gets uh, put into the public domain at its own pace, and it almost never is seen <clears throat> in time by policymakers who run behind the science. Just stay there one second, because I don't want to let politicians off the hook. In 1977, Jimmy Carter was president. He was handed a memo from his chief science advisor, which in two pages exactly summarized what Keeling was talking about and said, we are at an existential point where if we make changes now, we can do something about this. He chose not to. He sent it on to Jim Schlesinger, Secretary of Energy, uh, who said, ah, we don't know enough, let's wait. So the politicians, it's, it's not lack of knowledge, it's something else, there's something else, and I wanna to get to the other two, two the bananas in, in, in your metaphor, but there's something about politician, whether it's our Canadian environmentalist who hasn't done anything, whether it's Jimmy Carter back in the 70s, whether it's all of the other people globally, we are where we are. What is it about policymakers that they failed us? Well, they definitely have. I mean, again, back to the big ideas, but, you know, you go out on a limb, you need the people with you. It, just putting aside everything in the book, I think one big failure on the part of the environmental movement, in which I consider myself to be one, 
and I'm not personally a philanthropist, but I ran a foundation. It was very, very, very difficult to get environmental movement and environmentalists to think about the jobs implications of shifting from fossil fuels. Instead of promoting that shift as a reindustrialization, a reemployment program, putting public need to be secure in their economic futures first. We didn't, or they didn't. And so political will didn't build. It's one thing to have concern, but as you know, concern and fear are not motivators. And so if you're a politician, and not to get them off the hook, but even Jimmy Carter, poor guy, put a sweater on and he was vilified for telling you to turn the, you know, the, uh, the uh, thermostat down. And, you know, he may have passed that on to Schlesinger, but he also did try to, you know, promote nuclear power. He tried even Ronald Reagan. I mean, everybody knew about this. You know, everybody, six presidents knew about it. They all kicked the can. And I believe it's because, one, they 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 knew about it, but it was tomorrow. Secondly, the public wasn't clamoring for it. And third, it's just this inertia of a political system that gets heavier and heavier and heavier. And you need, you need courageous people. You need, you need breakthrough people. It's a cliche, but you need somebody to say what John Kennedy said in 10 years, we're putting a man on the moon, full stop. Yes, but that's just the United States. In no country anywhere on the planet has there been sustained movement to a non-carbon based economy. It's not just American failure, it's global failure. It's a global failure. But again, you know, you, 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 so back to the bananas, you know, okay, allowing for the politicians sneaking Okay, that's one vote. banana, second but banana. So science is running on its timeline. Even good policy, even good, wishful, hopeful policy runs on a political timeline, which is at least the electoral calendars in whatever the location. And then capital. In democracies. In democracies. Well, let's say we're only talking about democracies for now. But we can't. We have to talk about the globe because if the democracies can't solve this problem, that that is that that's the real challenge. And you point it out in the book. It's a global challenge. Right. Right. It's not just an American challenge or European challenge or an Indian challenge. True. But I mean, if you want, you know, again, do the doable, leave China for the moment out. But, you know, I'm a big believer in doability. So, you know, And meanwhile, the third banana, capital, which operates on all kinds of timelines, as short as a quarterly returns call, as long as an intergenerational portfolio transfer from a grandfather to a a, a niece or a granddaughter, you know, so the three things have not aligned and what needs to happen. And that's, excuse me, what needs to happen and what I try to say in the book is we have to align the scientific information with the application of capital, you know, made certain, as you know, companies, regulators, or rather companies, investors, regulatory certainty, they like, you know, there is no regulatory certainty and there's no standardization. So back to the carbon price, you have a pretty functional EU ETS, um, <clears throat> which is like putting up an umbrella. ETS means what for our listeners? Okay. So, you have a, a functioning cap and trade system in the European Union called the European Union Emissions Trading Scheme, which scheme is a schemey word and probably shouldn't be used, but it is the name of it. And if you think of, I mean, you know, you think about the global case. So let's say it's raining everywhere on earth on the same day. And I put up an umbrella in Cooperstown and stand under it. It's true. I'm dry. The rest of the world is wet. And the same is true of this EU ETS. It's put up an umbrella and capped emissions over the European Union, but the emissions are going up outside of the European Union. California has put a cap. Emissions, in theory, should be going down in California. The rest of the states, it's not. But but they're not. Importantly, they're not because it's not much of a cap. It's not much of a cap. Reggie, even less of a cap. But you do have the structures that if they could be linked and standardized, here's another moonshot, link California and Reggie. You know, then you have an indicative national carbon price de facto. Then you link Reggie and California to the EU ETS. Then you start to have a global carbon price de facto. So, you know, if I were queen, I would take the Article 6 negotiations and speed them up and say, okay, you want the rule book, cross-border adjustment, all this is good. But tomorrow we're trading carbon. Here's the standard. Here's the price. Let's see what happens. 
Now, let's follow that up because that is, I think, precisely an important part of the problem, which is leadership and agency. I would argue as a premise, there has been almost no leadership on the issue to speak of. We've had, and we'll have yet another UN meeting in Doha later this year, anything that has a 28 or a 38 or a 48 after its name is either a dead pope, in my judgment, or a pretty dead process. So where is the leadership going to come from? Because with all due respect, they're not going to make you queen and they're not going to make me king. And so we can't do it. Oh, I did speak to the Pope. No, you're right. Uh, the leadership is going to come from, you know, individuals stepping out. So, you know, it, it may be back to the Canada example. You know, I don't know who's going to hear this podcast, but, you know, why wouldn't uh, did Jamie Dimon go and talk to uh, 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 the prime minister of Canada and propose this? Maybe I should call Jamie Dimon. But let's talk about that because Jamie Dimon certainly knows how to do a bond restora- uh, a force restoration bond. That it's not an issue. But it hasn't occurred to him. Why have except 23% of global um, emissions are already covered by some kind of scheme. It's not new technology. It's tried and true technology. It just isn't applied technology. But these financial instruments are are still fairly new. The coral reef insurance fairly new. So it could be just a, a an informational problem. I mean, I take your point. Without a carbon price, none of the more exotic things uh, are going to uh, get anywhere. Thanks for listening so far. I hope you're enjoying the conversation as much as I have. If you haven't already, please subscribe on the platform of your choice and rate us on Apple Podcast. Now back to today's discussion, sponsored by the Stavros Niarchus Foundation, SNF. You... In the book, and appropriately, because this it is quite obviously true, at least if you believe in pricing, until carbon is expensive, we will live in a carbon a hydrocarbon world. You either have to ban it or tax it or it won't go away. It, we've seen that now. It, it, it's pretty obvious. The question is, will this bubble up from below? Will it be imposed from above? And will either of those two processes processes happen fast enough to actually save people. 62,000 people died in Europe last year from heat-related causes during during the summer. Well, we have to accelerate. I mean, you know Sylvia Earle and you know about her hope spots, right? And her approach to protecting the whole ocean is to find these places that you can still put off limits and then gradually link them up. And she calls them hope spots. If we're talking carbon pricing, I think maybe the same needs to be done. You take the EU ETS. I mean, it's easy for me to say, if I could go around and and and, and seed all these clap people and just get an appointment and say, why don't you do this and that? You know, not that I, uh, they would listen to me, but basically doability. People don't do things because they're afraid they're not doable. All you have to do is a lot of demonstrations. And I go back, maybe, <clears throat> maybe it's the crass carbon traders. Maybe it's the the people who are buying carbon. Maybe they start uh, a, a platform ICE. Maybe maybe I should go and talk to ICE or some of the big uh, commodities markets and say, why don't you just uh, link up? Why don't you why don't you find a way to uh, make a demo trade tomorrow? You know, all these things I think can be done. It's a question of people's you know imagination. Absence of imagination is is ex- an extremely important factor in why we're stuck with this problem. Very little imagination. Secondly, is the political structure and the dependence on fossil fuel. There's really no easy alternative. I just was was found out something yesterday I was working on, um, re- reviewing somebody's proposal to put solar panels in the, the Southwest on Navajo land. And I found out the extraordinary number of people who live in Navajo reservations without power at all when they're off the grid without wanting to be. It's not like they're, you know, uh, back to the woods people and have been two generations or three without power. And with a little package of solar array, you can power their entire house. And why isn't that being done with all the money that's going to Infrastructure Reduction Act and so on? Why aren't we massively 
massively with an army of people out there putting solar arrays on and uh, figuring out how to get the money back from the people or even just giving it to them. You know, there's so many solutions that are available that we're not doing for an absence, as I, as we've said, political will, but also doability. Everything has is, is become so cosmically big that people don't get started. And I, you know, I, I go back also to COVID, back to human nature. COVID broke a lot of momentum. It broke a lot of, and it's the only, COVID is the only, and I mentioned this in the book, it's the only time emissions have gone down in any significant way. But it proves the point that it if you point. crush the economy, right, it's a hydrocarbon-based economy. If you crush it, you will use less hydrocarbon. There'll be fewer emissions. Uh, and they went right back up, in fact, made up for lost ground because, again, last year, 2022, we added something like, I didn't get the numbers wrong, 30 gigatons of carbon to the atmosphere, which was more than ever before. And this year will be more than once again. So you're on this path in spite of the pandemic proof point that, yep, it's the economy, stupid. Yeah, well, um, I mean, that scares a lot of people. And so they don't want that. But, you know, let me ask you a question. You can test my premise, but back to crushing the economy. You know, I'm arguing based on you know world economic forum data and other data that the value of this of natural ecosystem services into the economy is not seen and is not recognized consequently it's like a hidden subsidy and that actually if you were going to value that you'd be uh we our economy would already be on its knees it's just not showing up in market valuation and if it started to we'd be looking at you know, prioritization perhaps differently, or, you know, our priorities might shift. And, and I don't know how to get at that unless the capital markets and the, and the sort of financial departments and the departments of treasury, and this is going on, you know, the accounting system shift, the uh, satellite accounts become not satellite, but integrated and start to affect uh, carbon. I mean, uh, credit ratings, you know, that you begin to um, situate the state of the economy uh, more clearly and uh, recognize the unpaid work of nature because it is a hidden subsidy. And, you know, I mean, I don't know if you uh, remember this, and, and, uh, but, uh, but it's in the book where, where uh, you know, Puma did an environmental P&L. And, you know, they reported their earnings as 202 uh, euros that year, except the environmental P&L looked at the negative impacts. If they had to pay for the water, you know, they used at a, at a higher rate, if they had to pay a carbon price, if they had to pay uh, real uh, property values for using the land that the, that the cows were grazing on, but they only buy the leather, they don't own the land, et cetera, et cetera. 145 euros of, of, of cost out of the 202 uh, rev euros earned that year. So significant drop in revenue. And that could be the case of a lot of companies. And if all companies had, that would be a big change, Alan. If all companies were strongly recommended, if not required. But by whom? But that I go back to agency. Who's going to, who's going to make this change? Shareholders, one, could do it. The SEC could do it. You know, they're coming up with a climate disclosure rule. Maybe they should require or, or strongly recommend a, uh, um, you know, an environmental P&L. Insurance companies, look at the insurance sector, is, 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 is running away from the highest risk. Why don't they uh, tie DNO insurance to an environmental P&L? That would be a step forward. Because that's not their business. Their business is to make money. It's an excellent point because what they're doing is withdrawing from those places, California, Florida, for example, uh, which are highly exposed to climate change, saying those risks are not insurable. Now, in the long run, 10, 20, 30, 40 years, that means people won't own houses in California or Florida. Exactly. We have 40 years or do we have four years? Well, I, th uh, well, I mean, the science tells us that we don't have 40 years. I mean, I go back to your original question is why aren't we doing anything? It's partly because it's easier to kick the can because the, the due date seems to keep being 2040, 2050. But you know very well from your experience, whatever your job is, and especially if you're a leader, you know, you have a limited time when you, when you have 
you can use your maximum authority, your maximum uh, imagination, your tenure to achieve something, your agency is at a peak only for a couple of years. So, you know, I think part of the doability issue is people in authority, whatever that authority role is, what can I do in five years? What can I actually do in five years? Can I get five years worth of reduction? Can I get five years worth of expanded forest resilient bond? Can I get five years of anything that matters? And then I could get five more and five more. But if we start, if everything is on a 20 or 40 year horizon, it's just too easy not to do anything. And, you know, the DNO, uh, the insurance, it may not be their business because they're in money to make money. But as you said, they won't be able to make money if they have to get out of every market. And then where does that cost land? I mean, this, this, uh, you know, back to these silly little uh, analogies, but the bouncing ball, you know, follow the bouncing ball when you sing. Well, the cost of these disasters is like a bouncing ball bouncing around the economy. It's not hitting the real economy yet, but it's hitting the people who, whose houses are burned out and can't get a new one because there's no insurance. It's hitting FEMA, which is you and me through our taxpayer because FEMA is constantly having to shell out. And it's hitting you know the insurance companies who can't seem to uh, continue insuring, certainly reinsurance. And so you know when do those costs actually hit the real economy? And I would argue that they're hitting it. We just don't see it. And we're going to see it possibly in some kind of an environmental default where you have what if all of Canada's forests went on fire tomorrow? They practically already are. What about smoke in the in, the, in America? If, if, if leaving aside the forest fires themselves, you know everything would stop again. So I, want like to, COVID. I want to push on that just one more time. Um, U.S. environmental policy is almost an oxymoron relative to the problem. China equally badly. Those are the two superpowers. Arguably, the Europeans have done the most in terms of all sorts of different approaches to uh, to this issue, including the, the largest, most significant uh, effort to price carbon, uh, and most recently to impose a border tax that if you are producing something with more carbon, you're going to have to pay a tax to get it into Europe. Uh, that's good. That's leadership. You could make a case, though, that Europe doesn't grow anymore, partially perhaps as a consequence. In 2008, the American economy was smaller than the European economy. In 2023, the United States economy is three times bigger uh, than the European economy. They don't grow anymore. And that is partially a conscious set of choices about consuming carbon. Uh, How do we get other people to say, yep, we're going to trade off that growth because it's killing the planet. The Europeans did. The Americans haven't. The Chinese haven't. The Indians refuse. The Brazilians say absolutely positively not. Um, and we're headed in this direction of the lack of leadership. And I go back, you said it a couple of times, it really does seem like it comes finally to the L word, which in this case is leadership. Yeah. Well, leadership, you know, nothing without leadership, but, you know, to your point, and this is radical, but, you know, I would say, first of all, uh, you know, it's a privilege to renounce growth. And I'm not so sure that you renounce it necessarily. There's other forms of growth, but even allowing for that, um, you know, I argue in the book, for example, take the Congo, you know, these are very poor countries. Um, You know, they're sitting on, the last remaining rainforest that's actually a net uh, sequestrator. They're sitting on tons of peat that, that hold thousands of years worth of, of carbon that sits on top of oil. And the world is asking them to renounce that oil and renounce cutting the trees, renounce releasing the peat. The prime minister of Ecuador, president of Ecuador, proposed something 20 years ago, which uh, he called the Yasuni bond, which would have been the same thing. Don't would pay us not to develop the oil, not to take it out of the ground. And that was very well received, but the money to pay pay the Ecuadorians never materialized. The government was corrupt. It, it didn't work. But there may be room for that idea again, because why would the Congo, even if it's a sterling example of, of, of efficient government, even in under those circumstances, which it isn't, 
maybe it's time to say that we have to compensate those countries that that have sequestration potential for the quote renunciation of growth, namely the burning of the fossil fuel. Because I don't see any other way to avoid their taking. We've seen that we've done that experiment too. Oil producing countries produce oil. There's no, you know, there's no uh, example where they don't. Norway produces it, gives, you know, takes with one hand, gives with the other. But at least Norway uses its money and and has, you could argue, moving moving itself away from fossil fuels while enabling everybody else to use fossil fuels. Big contradiction. You probably saw the Times yesterday, the article about the Ford Motor Company, where Ford is is going hat in hand for a po- collaboration with with uh, China to help learn, to learn literally how to make a certain kind of battery, which Ford doesn't seem to have the ex, ex, uh, expertise to do on its own. So China being autocratic, but they've made huge investments in these technologies and their next gen, you know, story I like to tell and I tell it in the book. When I started the Tianjin Climate Exchange in, in, in China with Richard Sandor and, and Petro China, you know, there was nobody who, who outside of the high elite intellectual research council for the Communist Party, carbon markets were not known. Today, there's hundreds of people who've been trained in them, and they're ready to launch the world's biggest carbon market. So, you know, there's ways of growing your economy, training your people that 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 are that are that are sort of resting on the quote green economy. You don't have to give up everything, but the compensation to the countries that are poor, but still rich in biodiversity and and carbon sequestration potential, we've got to transfer money to them. And I would even argue that they are the creditor companies, uh, countries, and we're the debtor countries in terms of that. You know, the transfer of value from them to us is in, is, is is huge. Let's leave it there. It is an optimistic note. You are looking for solutions and we need solutions. And I, I want to encourage people to, to get the book, Pricing the Priceless, The Financial Transformation to Value the Planet, Solve the Climate Crisis, and Protect Our Most Precious Asset by Paula DePerna. Thank you, Paula, for the conversation and for the book. Thank you so much, Alan. Always a pleasure. Take care. Thank you for listening to this episode of New Thinking for a New World. I'm Alan Stoga, podcast host. And I look forward to your joining our next conversation. Remember, tell us what you think at telbergfoundation.org.